the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns His face away. Are the chosen one bring many sons to glory? Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulder. Ashamed, I hear my mocking voice call out among the stars. My sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power.
Good morning. Good morning to those of you here in the sanctuary and those of you online. Welcome this morning. We're thankful that the Lord has woken us up this morning and nudged us out of the right or the left side of the bed and leaned us toward the church so that we are here. We get to enjoy one another. We get to be encouraged by the Lord's presence as we come before Him this morning. Those of you that are online, thank you as well for joining in worship. And so I hope that you have greeted one another. And if you have prayer requests, I invite you to share them uh, with one another. Those of you here in the sanctuary, if you'll take that fellowship pad and fill that out and let us know if there are prayer requests that you would like to have us pray for through the week and otherwise our deacons uh, make note of those. I'd like to uh, draw your attention to a couple of items on our announcement sheet. The first off is of course our Jazz Vesper service that is tonight at 6 p.m. And so if you are looking for something a little snappy in order to worship the Lord and to see the gift of jazz musicians that God has created for His own glory. Come at 6 p.m. this evening. We will have a wonderful time. It's about a one-hour service. Uh, we have uh, Cal Jazz professional musicians that lead that, and we weave into that the word of the Lord. So that's a great time. For those um, of you that have helped in the past and continue to on our campus workday, know that our July workday is not going to be on the weekend of 4th of July, but rather July 15th, middle of the month like it was this last month. And then also, this coming uh, Wednesday at noon, if you're interested in helping to plan some of our 19th Street Explorer events that are going to happen for the second half of this year, come join us um, in Baird Hall to have a brown bag lunch together, and we're going to be looking at all the fun things that we can do nearby uh, to enjoy one another. And then finally, how many of you enjoy a good game around a table? Raise a hand. If you enjoy a good game, uh, beginning July 3rd on Monday nights every other week, uh, we're going to have a game night here uh, again in Baird Hall. So hope that you can put that on your calendars and we can enjoy that uh, time together. Very good. Let's come before the Lord in prayer as we continue in worship. Let's do that. Lord, how thankful we are that you have carved out this place, that you raised this sanctuary, Lord that you have called each one of us to know you. And so, Lord, we come before you to give you thanks, to give you worship and praise, Lord, for life, good life that you give to us, for the way that you sustain us. Lord, would you do your good work in this hour to draw forth from us praise that gives us energy and courage to be your good light to the world you love. This we ask in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now let me invite you to stand as you may be able to and join me in the call to worship taken from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? One thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek. For in the day of trouble he will conceal me in his tabernacle. And in the secret place of his tent he will hide me. He will lift me up on a rock. Indeed, amen, amen. Please remain standing as you may be able to. Let's sing together our opening hymn, Near to the Heart of God. Come. 
voice we near to the heart of God, a place where we can save your needs, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us to wait before me, near to the heart of God. Here's the place of call release, near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace, near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us to wait before thee, near to the heart of Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the prayer of confession based on Colossians 3.11. Father, Holy Spirit, and Jesus, you are three persons, yet wonderfully one. So united are you in purpose, care, and respect that you serve as our model. We who are your people, and the Bride of Christ. Yet I know my insecurities, which cause me to feel less worthy than my sister or brother in Christ. And rather than rejoicing in our common foundation and goal in Christ, I give importance to our differences, and this inhibits me. Faithful Holy Spirit, help me know the priority that you are in every one of us, so that me reflect you. This I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hear the Apostle Peter's words of blessing to the repentant first disciples and to us. To those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you. 2 Peter 1, 1 and 2. In Jesus the Christ, we are forgiven and led. Let us pass the peace of Christ to one another with a physical greeting or a wave as you are comfortable.
I think it was now uh, three weeks ago, 14 days ago, no, it was uh, two weeks ago, uh, that we ordained and installed some new deacons and elders, but not all of them were present for us to install. And so as good Presbyterians that do things in good and proper order, we are going to get them installed and get them ordained this morning. We're thankful for those that have heard the call of the Holy Spirit to serve. And so I would like to invite up uh, those that were not able to be installed. In fact, we've even called um, one all the way from Italy to join us this morning. So Thomas Stahl, would you please join us? Paula Emick, thank you, one of our incoming deacons. And would you like to read, read the others that we've got? If you are... Oh, they're still in the office, so why don't you go grab those? And meanwhile, I'll be... Uh, let's see, who else do we have here? We've got Stephen Hansen, who is working our AV booth. Come on up, Stephen. And let's see, we have Kathy. I would like for you to come up because you're coming in as a deacon. You are really shy. You've got to know that it's your time. And so I expect you to pop up and help me because you're testing my memory here. Let's see. And we've got uh, one more at least. Jo Simmons all the way. She even flew farther than Italy, all the way from New Zealand. Thank you, right. And so last, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we had three uh, officers that uh, were called into service. Thelma Campbell uh, on session, as well as Marilyn Switzer as one of our deacons, and Marty Sortion, who's also there in the AV booth. And so uh, we have done what's good and proper, and Daniel Beauvais, our clerk of session, is bringing our certificates of both installation and ordination. And uh, this time, we're going to remember to ask the congregational question, too. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of that last time. So Daniel and I will take turns. Um, we are going to ask common questions for both deacons and elders. There are a number of questions, and then there's one specific question to the elders that will be installed, and one specific question to the deacons who will be installed. Very good. And so first we're going to read a, a passage of Scripture um, between Daniel and I. There are different gifts. But it is the same Spirit who gives them ways of serving God. But it is the same Lord who is served. God works through different people in different ways. But it is the same God who achieves his purpose through them all. Each one is given a gift by the Spirit. To use it for common good. Together we are the body of Christ. And individually members of him. Though we have different gifts, together we are a ministry of reconciliation led by the risen Christ. Amen. And so here are these questions to all of you as incoming officers. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge Him Lord of all and head of the church, and through Him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? If so, please say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, please say, I do. I do. do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic? and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do, and will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, please say, I do and I will. I do and I will. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, please say, I will. 
Will you be governed by our church's polity? Will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, please say, I will. Will you, in your own life, seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, please say, I will. And do you promise to further the peace, the unity, and the purity of the church? If so, please say, I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, please say, I will. Very good. And now a question to the incoming elders. Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in the governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. I will. Thank you. For the incoming deacons, will you fulfill deacon? Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I will. Thank you. And now questions to the congregation. Do we, the members of North Kirk, accept these elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? If so, say, we do. We do. And do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions, to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? If so, say, we do. At this time, I would like to um, invite those that have not previously served as an elder and deacon and will be ordained to an officer position to stand here in the middle. And so that would be Kathy and Steve and Joe. If you would stand, well, you've been already, yes, you've been a deacon. So Steve and Kathy stand here. And I'd like to invite uh, any other officers uh, that have served before, that have been ordained, to come step forward as we lay hands on them and pray for them in their service for the Lord here. Very good. Would you bow your heads and join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, you who call and you who can see what we do not yet see, thank you for the ones that you have called to serve you in positions of responsibility where their first task is to hear your voice and your guidance. Teach us, Lord, to be more like you. Would you bless these, Steve and Kathy, in their service? Would you have them lead us well so that your name would be glorified? We are thankful for them, and we give this thanks in your name, Jesus, and all God's people said, amen, amen. Let us give the Lord thanks for their service. And just before you step down, we have, we have certificates. So certificates of installation and ordination or installation, if you've already been ordained. Very good. And then there's, uh, they've got Marilyn over here on the left, and we've got Marty in the back, and Thelma, Thelma there near the AV booth. Yeah, there you go. You get two, Kathy. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Over here. And now, Kathy, I'd like to invite you back up, and you can continue your service. Thank you very much. (laughs) Okay, we will now be accepting your offerings. Uh, If you're a guest today, we want you to know that there are no expectations, and we hope this service will be a blessing to you. Uh, Christ loved us so much 
that he gave himself as an offering on our behalf. Let us follow Christ by giving our offerings with joy and thanksgiving. Will the ushers please come forward and collect the offering? Save him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise God, her Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Would you bow your head with me as we give thanks? Father, we are blessed to be given life under the canopy that you have created. Such beauty in the skies as the seasons move from one to the other. So gracefully you've brought the sun through the spring and leaves have unfolded and fruit is beginning to draw out. Father, you give us the luxury of summer, days to enjoy, long days, pleasant evenings. Lord, for all of this we are thankful. And we give back to you, Lord, a portion so that you would know our full reliance is upon you, the one who brings the seasons and blesses us always. Take these gifts, Lord, and multiply them so that others would know Jesus. We ask this in his name and all God's people said, amen, amen. 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 Please be seated. The scripture reading today is from James 5, verses 13 through 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of, sa of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave, gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, 
you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kathy. And with the words that Kathy has read for us, we come to the close of James's letter. Interesting way to draw to a close. A letter that was intended for all of the churches. A letter that was intended to address the very real issues, the problems, the stress that was going on in the early congregations. Stresses that we experience even today. And so, as James draws to a close his letter, the issues that he addresses are suffering. Suffering that results in sickness, but suffering as it also has to do with confession. Suffering that can be addressed by one who is able to turn back a brother or a sister who has wandered away. James closes his letter with these powerful words, recognizing that we all need guidance. We need guidance in our life. When we are little ones, without thinking about it, we have a humility that instinctively we know that the parent that loves us will guide us safely through the day and through the night. Otherwise, why would we call out in the middle of the night for our mother or for our father? We just know instinctively they are safety and they will always be there to care for us. They will guide us into the safe place, back into our bed where nothing will harm us. And we grow up in those years and Jesus recognizes the importance of being that child and having that humility, being able to trust a loving parent. And we will see what, how he uses that in the church. But we move from that childhood to, of course, we become a teenager. And it's in those teenage years that we somehow get this idea in our mind, you know what, maybe my parents don't really know how to guide me. Maybe I can figure this out on my own, or maybe I can get some guidance from TikTok or, you know, what, a Snapchat or whatever it might be, but maybe I can figure it out on my own. And then we live a few years as a young adult, and uh, then we realize that we don't know everything. For some of us, that takes us into our 40s or 50s or 60s. But we realize at one point that we don't know everything and that the world can be dangerous and that it's really helpful to have someone that can guide us with our physical health, lots of different areas of our life. But there's also in this world opportunity that we need to be guided by teachers that can teach us new skills, expertise, and areas where we might serve. Or we might even be guided to win a million dollars. Now, last week we learned what we would do if we had a million dollars, right? Remember that movie? Um, <laughs> if, if I had a million and with those seven, con, uh, seven recipients of... Uh, of a John Glidden who gave a million dollars to each. Well, what do you know? That idea is pretty popular. Uh, who hasn't fantasized about winning the lottery? Uh, what would I do if I won the lottery? Uh, well, uh, we're, that was turned into a game show. Uh, who wants to be a millionaire? But did you know that there was also a British version of who wants to be a millionaire? But of course, a million pounds is a little bit more than a million dollars. And so the show starts, but it operates along the idea of needing guidance. Because whatever questions you might ask on your way, might be asked on your way to actually win a million dollars, you might need help. You remember what those were called? 
Lifelines, that's right, lifelines. And so with the UK version, uh, because they're always mm, just on that side of uh, uncomfortable, they start the show and they say, who will you call? Your friend? Are they your friend? Does your friend have your back? <laughs> will they actually help you with a question or will they mislead you? Who would you call if you needed help in order to win a million dollars? So I, I drew a couple of examples here. One of the, the first contestants on this show was a young man by the name of Colin. And Colin maybe had uh, uh, one too many jammy dodgers as a little guy growing up. So he was pretty good size, and he was wearing glasses, and he had a very, very thick Cockney accent. So that the host, this is not uh, Regis uh, Philbin here in the American version, but you know the, the host is trying to guide him through these questions and trying to make sure you know, that uh, he understands, so that, so that the host understands his response. So he comes to a question, and the question is this, which of these, which word among these means wickedness? And here were the four options. One, topography, as the UK announcer pronounced it. The second one, turpitude. The third, torpidity. And the fourth, terp, <laughs> I'm going to try this, terpsichorean. Terpsichorean, which of those four mean wickedness? And Colin is sitting there and he's sweating and he doesn't know whether he should ask the audience for help or call his lifeline friend and he decides he's going to call his friend Peter. And so he has to be able to explain to his fellow Cockney friend Peter Peter, and to get from him, Peter, which of these words do you think means wickedness? And so he gets Peter on the line, and of course, he's trying to pronounce these words through his Cockney accent, and he gives up very quickly, and he just begins spelling them. So he says to Peter, now Peter, the words topography, T-O-P-O-G-R-A-F-Y, that's the first one. The next one, tepitude, T-U-P-I-T-U-D-E. The third one, torpidity. And he goes through all the letters and then finally, terp sexorian, T-E-P-S-I-C-H-O-R-E-A-I-N. And they've only got 30 seconds to get an answer. So he's explaining the whole thing. And Peter's on the other end just being bowled over by all of this cockney coming at him. And so Peter's on the other line and you hear him on, on the program going, I, I, I... Oh, he's depending upon him to win. The prize at this level is 32,000 pounds, more money than, than Colin's ever had in his life. I, I think it's the second one, but he's not able to pronounce it back to Colin. And what do you know? That's the right answer. Turpitude is the right answer. So, hooray, Colin is ecstatic. He and Peter, you know, are, have helped each other out. Colin has been guided by a friend when he needed help. We need help at times. The second contestant on the show was a, um, a woman. Um, she looked, as the English would say, posh, very well-dressed uh, with jewelry, etc. Uh, and she looked like she was well-to-do. And the question asked to her was worth 8,000 pounds. And this was the question. Black, brown, and Kodiak are varieties of which animal? She did not know the answer to that. She might have been nervous. So she decided she would not trust the audience and call her lifeline. His name? Also Peter. <laughs> Peter, who she described as, he's brilliant. He's my gardener. And so uh, she gets him on the line, Peter on the line. She says to Peter, Peter, black, brown, and Kodiak are varieties of which animal? Peter didn't take half a second. Bear. And she realized, of course, they are a bear, but she was just so nervous. She was glad to have Peter's guidance at that point. We need guidance in our life when we're nervous, when we're stressed. 
And the Lord wants to be the guide for us. He gives us the gift of one another to help guide us. But there are times when the Lord's guidance is ultimately what we need, even if it's by the prayers of others in the body of Christ as we face something large in our life, a suffering, an illness, something going on. We need guidance in our life. And so, as Kathy has read this passage for us, bear in mind that James is giving us guidance on how we're to receive guidance personally, but also as a congregation. And so, what might look in this passage like a sequence of almost non sequiturs, James is really talking about guiding us as individuals, but then when a congregation has a decision to make. And so let's, uh, let's jump into that. So the first, the first off are those that James addresses, are any among you sick? They should call, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I jumped out of line there. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Now, when he writes this, and notice there's a difference there between suffering and what we're going to come up in the next line, sick. So this, this suffering word is, is not a suffering that's associated with a physical ailment, but it's a suffering that's associated with an external situation that we're going through. Maybe it's, it's a persecution of other people that are treating us uh, in an unjust way, in this case, maybe because they were Christians early in that first century. Maybe they were going through uh, some, some difficult situation, but it's by circumstance outside of themselves. And so James is, uh, when he posits that, he says, are any among you suffering? He compares that to are any cheerful? And again, cheerfulness comes by way of external circumstance. The things are going well for me right now. And so James has advice for those believers in the churches. If you're going through a difficult time, circumstantially, in the town, the village where you live, you should pray. Now, this prayer because we're going to see that there's different words here underneath that all are translated as pray in English, but James used different words for different kinds of prayer or entreaty or request or urgency. In this case, when we are going through a difficult circumstance because others might be treating us cruelly, James's advice is we should pray. And this pray is a Greek word that is related to the word for our knee. It means get down on your knee and pray. And we pray to God when we are suffering at the hands of others because we need to know how the Lord would guide us in our response. We never want to return evil for evil, Jesus teaches us. But we need to understand how it is that we can still care for the one who will persecute us. And so James's encouragement there is to go down on our knee personally when we encounter that kind of external suffering in our life. And then in a similar vein, when things are going well for us, outside of ourselves, circumstantially, we should still engage with God and we should be singing to God. And so here is this idea that praying and singing are in some ways the same thing. When we sing, we are speaking, we are conversing in lyric and melody with the Lord, and we are telling the Lord we are happy. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for my family. Thank you for the food on my plate. So, whether we pray on our knee or whether we're standing with hands up and a voice raised, James always encourages us to be guided by the Lord, to recognize that He guides us through the difficult times, but also the good times as well. 
Now, though, James then turns to what goes on in a congregation. Are any among you sick? Now, here we have to uh, be very careful with this word sick. The word here that's translated sick, and, and we touched on this in, in, in earlier passages uh, in the scriptures. When we think about being sick, you and I think, well, what's your blood pressure? You and I think, have you taken some ibuprofen? Or have you taken some other kind of medication? Are you hurt? We immediately go to the idea of treatment that we have for the physiology that we understand. But put yourself in the shoes of someone 2,000 years ago who did not understand the pH of a saline of what might be, you know, in our body, in balance or out of balance, chemicals. All that they would have known is, I am incapacitated. And so this word here that says, are any among you sick? It is more exactly translated, are any of you, are any among you incapacitated? It's, in fact, it's a word that has an opposite, the letter A. So we might say symptomatic or asymptomatic. It means the opposite. And so here, this Greek word underneath here is strong, but the word here is the opposite of strong. Are you weak? Are you incapacitated? And we might be incapacitated by a stomach flu, by a pain, by a cancer, but we already know terms and we know what those things mean. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have any of that. They just understood, are, how are you? Are you well or are you not? And so the question here that James is asking, is any within the congregation incapacitated? And look what he calls. He says, they should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them. Now, what is it about the elders? Why should this person who's incapacitated call the elders as opposed to calling any other brother or sister in Christ? The clue is what James says a little later on. Therefore, confess your sins. So there is something going on here in the incapacitation that has to do with confession and confessing to the elders. Now, why would we confess to the ones that we just brought forward here who are tasked with leading and guiding and protecting the body of Christ? Why should someone call these people when they are incapacitated? For that, I'm going to take us back into Matthew chapter 18. When Jesus made a statement that can sound to us um, otherworldly, Jesus said to his disciples, whatever you will bind here on earth will have been bound in heaven. And whatever you release here on earth will have been loosed in heaven. And we hear that and we go, what does that mean? What does that mean? And it has to do with uh, legal terms, actually. That is binding, that means holding on to something. And then releasing is the word that was used um, in Aramaic for forgiveness. So whenever something was held or bound, that was a corrective that was made. And when something was released, that's when forgiveness was given. And so in Matthew 18, the disciples come to Jesus and they ask him a question. They say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And we know that because we've seen their interactions. They're trying to kind of get in front of one another so that when Jesus comes into his glory, one might have a greater position than the other. Right? We know that even James and John, their mother comes to Jesus and says, when you come into your glory, will you see that my two sons are, are treated the best because you know 
they are the best. What mother wouldn't say that about their own children? But Jesus surprises them. And what he does is he takes a little child that's nearby. And he says, you see this little child? Unless you become like this little child, you cannot be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What? But it's that thing that we talked about earlier. That child who just knows in the middle of the night, when I call out for my mom or dad, I know they love me. I know that what they tell me to do, that will lead me into safety. And as followers of Jesus, we need to have that kind of humility. To be like a child. To be like a child that will say, whatever you say, whatever you say Jesus, wherever you guide me, I will go. Take my hand. That's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus went on to say, and every one of you must receive one another like that little child so that when the followers of Jesus come together and we see that simple humility that says, I just want to do what the Lord teaches me to do, that we receive them fully appreciating that spirit and ourselves holding that for one another. And so this is the task that's given to the elders. Jesus is essentially teaching his disciples who will become the apostles and, and, and the elders of the churches where they're at. Protect my flock. These little ones that are so humble that they listen for my voice. If anyone should cause them to stumble, it would be better for them to have a millstone tied around their neck and they'd be thrown into the sea. In Matthew 18, Jesus says, you must become like a child and you must ensure that the flock is protected in that innocence of wanting to hear my guidance to them. And so, then comes this question of, when someone does cross a boundary and hurt someone else in the flock, they cause one of these little ones to stumble and they hurt them, what does the church do? And in Matthew 18, Jesus tells them, you go to your brother or your sister that's caused the stumbling. You go to them privately and you raise the issue to them. And if, if they turn around, wonderful. If they don't, Go back into the flock and come back with another person. And the two or three of you engage the person about how they're causing harm in the flock. And if they won't listen to you, then Jesus says, you need to put them out of the fellowship. Put them out of the flock. Treat them, Jesus says, as you would a Gentile. That was the context that they understood in their Jewish culture. We can have nothing to do with you because you are harming the ones that are trying to follow Jesus. Peter picks up on this. He knows what Jesus is talking about. When Jesus says, whatever you bind will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose will have been loosed in heaven. Jesus is saying, I will be with you by my Holy Spirit. And as you seek to care for the flock in my name, you will do what I would have done. And so what you bind by the requirement when you say to a person, you cannot be part of this flock because you are harming someone and you will not repent. Jesus is saying, in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are with you. But there may come a time when they will repent. Because Peter asked Jesus next in Matthew 18, how many times must I forgive my brother? He knew what it was like to have someone hurt, say they would change, and then be forgiven and come back and hurt again. And so Peter wanted to know, how many chances do we give them? Seven? And Jesus, of course, said 70 times seven. 
And that's not 490 exactly. It's an expression, right? Okay. So, but the point there that Jesus is making is that there's restoration into the flock. Jesus wants restoration. Jesus is telling Peter and the others, as many times as they will sincerely repent, you forgive them so they can come back and be part of my flock. I love them. I am going to give my life for you all. That is what I believe James is addressing when he's saying, are any among you incapacitated? weakened. You've been put out. You've been put out of the flock. And this is why they must own their sin. They must confess what they've done, and they must tell it to the elders who are responsible for the flock. They are only to pray with that person that's been incapacitated after they anoint that person with oil in the order, the way this is written. Why is that important? Because oil was a symbol of the Holy Spirit's presence. Jesus, Jesus sees the dove come down upon him. The Holy Spirit comes down upon him. And so kings were anointed with oil in the Old Testament as a symbol of God's very presence. Jesus is anointed with oil by other people throughout his ministry. So when this person has confessed to the elders, oil is put on his head or her head as a way of saying, you've acknowledged that what you've done is wrong, and now you are again walking with God. Here is God with you. And so the oil would have been poured on their head. And then they would have all prayed together in the name of the Lord. That Jesus is the one who has desired the restoration and is with them going forward. And it says that that prayer, the prayer of all of them with faith trusting, will save the sick. And so here, this word sick is one who is fatigued. So again, we think of our English word, we think of sick. The word literally means fatigued or weary. They have been left outside the congregation for so long, they finally hit rock bottom. They're weary, and they're ready to come back in. It says that the Lord will literally lift them up from this dark place where they're at as they are restored into the fellowship. They, and if they have been committed sins, they will be forgiven. And so there is that idea of, of why the confession is necessary. But this closes it, really, is that, is that James writes, Therefore, to everyone who's reading this letter, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another. Now, this pray for one another is, uh, is not the normal, it's not the pray, take a knee. It's, 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 a, it's a word that means supplicate or entreat or wish. That is, be on the side of one another and ask God to help restore the one who has sinned. As we confess our sins to one another, we don't recoil from one another. We care for one another. We say, I want you to get above and beyond past this sin. And so that's that kind of prayer. We supplicate, we pray for one another so that we may be healed. We hear the word healed and we think of physiology. Here this word is used metaphorically as the Semitic language is used so richly, words and pictures. Healed is a metaphorical word for restored. Restored into the fellowship. Prayer is powerful, and that's why James talks about Elijah. Because when we pray for one another, that we would be restored into the fellowship, that the Lord would convict the person that what they've done is wrong. God hears the prayer of the righteous, and He says, your heart is where my heart is, and I will do what you ask, because your heart is matches my heart. 
Elijah prayed that way so that people would know and repent to the Lord. And the sky was closed for three years and six months. So God will answer that prayer for restoration when our hearts want them to be restored rather than saying, Lord, don't ever let them back in here. And that's a challenge to us. It's a challenge to us. In Matthew 18, Jesus goes on to give a, a, a parable about a, a slave who's forgiven his debts, and yet that slave would not forgive others who were indebted to him. And Jesus, Jesus makes it very, very clear. We who have been forgiven must always, 70 times 7, be prepared to forgive even one amongst us who has hurt us if they sincerely come back to the Lord. All right, so he prayed. Finally, those of you that will turn back one who's wandered away from Christ, you and me, we are guided in that drawing a brother or sister back. They wander from the truth, and James wants us to know that it's their very soul that will be saved, rescued from death as we embark upon that. That's not an easy thing to do, especially if we have felt the pain of what someone else has done to us. But we remember, we remember what Christ did for us. We, who nailed Christ to the cross, still comes back for us to forgive. All right, so we're going to close with the American who wants to be a millionaire. His name was John Carpenter. He was an IRS agent. What do you think an IRS agent knows? He had no interest in the show. Some friends came over. They turned it on the television. He decided, all right, I'll try it. Two days later, he was on the show. He had answered all the questions on the uh, sign-up line right away. Regis Philbin described him as having cruised right through the first 14 questions as he reached the final question that would be worth a million dollars. And this was the question. Which of these U.S. presidents appeared on the television series Laugh-In? A, Lyndon Johnson. B, Richard Nixon. C, Jimmy Cotta. Or D, Gerald Ford. Carpenter stalled for a second. A million dollars. Who would he call? He was born in 1967. He was too young to remember who would have been on Laughing if he was maybe five years old or so. He called his dad. He didn't even ask his dad the question. He said, Dad, I'm going to be a millionaire. And he turned around. And he gave them the answer. And I don't remember who the answer was. I'm so bad. I should have written that down in the sermon notes. But he answered it right, and he won a million dollars. He's... uh, How many people are like that, that don't need guidance? That's not you or I. That's that's not you or I. The Lord wants to guide us. And so let's know that we can take a knee for what goes on in our own life, and we can ask the Lord to restore one who's wandered away. Let's give the Lord thanks. Lord, thank you for your good word for James. Lord, thank you that you do not bring us together accidentally but we have the gift of one another. And so thank you, Lord, when we sing songs and we get to be brought before your throne. And thank you, Lord, when we're corrected also by a brother or sister. We want to be like you, Lord Jesus. Make us Christ like you, we ask Jesus in your name. And all God's people said, amen, amen.
Would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for a great week of sunny days and beautiful weather, especially after all the weeks of gloom that we had. It's been so beautiful. We're thankful for all that you provide us. As we know, everything comes to us by your hand. We thank you for the gift of your Son and the Holy Spirit, which, as we see in Colossians, work together as one with you to guide us through our life. We pray that you will be with little Elliot, who is turning one and needs to stay healthy for his upcoming open-heart surgery on July 10th. Prayers also that you will guide the hands of the doctors and nurses as well. We pray for Pilar, her mother-in-law, Karen, and her son, Connor. Prayers for her daughter, Megan, as well as she is in Florida visiting family. Steve and I would like prayers for Jesse, our grandson-in-law, who is being deployed to Bahrain this week. Pray that he will have safe travel and service while he's there. And we pray also for his young daughter, Sunny, who is really struggling. <laughs> we also ask for prayers for our Sarah, who was in a serious car accident a few weeks ago, and she's facing a couple of months in a wheelchair and then several more of rehab. Her place of employment has informed her that they will only hold her job until August 2nd, which will mean a loss of benefits. And so we pray for a satisfactory solution for her. Uh, we ask for prayers for Ruth Lee, who entered hospice on Friday. And we ask, Lord, that you will give her your comfort and goodness. Kathy Moody, prayers for her brother, Brothers, Jimmy and Ronnie, both are in the hospital. Ronnie has a lump on his lungs, and they're hoping, praying that it's not cancer. And her sister, Gail, has renal fa failure. Prayers or praise for Jeannie Gapper, that test came back okay. Also for travel mercies for Emily Rispery, returning from New Jersey later this week, and for her grandma Claudia's continued favorable radiation treatment results. We pray for Margie Wong's friend, Celia, who is suffering from post-COVID lung problems. <clears throat> uh, prayers also for Carolyn Ford, who is in the hospital with an infection. Now would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand if you are able and join us since we have many reasons to sing Blessed Be Your Name.
I could actually do it from back there because I've got my mic. I don't have to be here. Yeah. I just realized that. So <laughs> how's it been? <laughs> yeah, six months on a year. Paul's letter to the Philippians encourages us with this benediction. Don't worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understandings, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's go in peace.